Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, broadcasting live from the beautiful, uh, I'm going to add hot and humid, uh, Cape May, <laughs> New Jersey today. It is super hot. It is oppressively hot in uh, Cape May, New Jersey. And it's wonderful because I'm by the beach. So everybody's going to say, why are you complaining? Because you're by, you're by the beach. Why should you be? complaining about it being hot and humid because it's it's Cape May, but it is still very, so that that is why I'm sporting a sundress today instead of my, my usual kind of business attire because it is just far too hot, but it is beautiful and I'm coming to you via the fine people at SHR Media and streaming live on Facebook. And my guest today is uh, Karen Eldad and she's going to speak to us today about she's a, excuse me, let me backtrack. She's a speaker, author, and coach. She's going to talk to us about how to enterprise with enthusiasm. And she's a very enthusiastic, very enthusiastic and super cool chick. So I'm excited about talking to her today. And I think you will be too. And then in the second hour today, I have uh, the one and only Mr. Jordan B. Rickards, who's an attorney and the mastermind behind conservativeopinion.com. Uh, we're going to talk to him about uh, Bernie and AOC and uh, all the things that they want to do uh, in, in our fine world of politics. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce, I'm sorry I'm running late this morning. I had some technical difficulties or this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to introduce Karen Eldad. How are you? How are you? It's such a pleasure to be here. And what a very gem that you're presenting the people today. <laughs> Well, you know, I like to have shows that are that uh, offer a lot of different things and are just kind of different. So uh, and and have a, a diverse set of topics. And so I'm very happy to have you on the show today. You're going to offer like the super positive, enthusiastic aspect of, of life and and how we can incorporate that into kind of our our business life and, and all aspects of our life. And then we're going to kind of revisit the more cynical aspects of uh, life and politics in our second hour. So I'm liking what we're I doing today. So I'm excited. <laughs> so before we get into that, tell us a little bit about your background, if you would. Sure thing. So I'm an executive coach and personal coach. I've been doing this for several years now. I coach some of the biggest teams in the world, like J.D. Morgan and the fine people at Fendi and Dior, who I'm sure you are familiar with. And uh, a lot of superstar entrepreneurs and individuals around the country and around, around the world who are just interested in living their fullest, most exciting, and most successful life. And in that vein, I actually wanted to talk to you about laying God. First of all, I believe, and I really mean this, that you're doing God's work, not only in teaching, but also in speaking to people about financial mastery. It's extremely important. It's the most fundamental skill of our lives. It's shocking to me that it's never taught even in grade school. And what I really approach it as is wealth consciousness, which is almost a level above that or even a below that, if you will, depending on how you're building your little pyramid. And um, one of the fundamental skills that I teach all of the uh, executives and individuals with whom I coach is how to master the uh, mindset of money so that they can go, what I like to say, not only for being a mediocre millionaire, but a really prosperous Excited now, I bet they love to hear that because uh, quiet as it's kept, if you talk to people with money, sometimes they are not as happy as you would suspect. Actually, in fact, I found the inverse to be true. You are not only spot on, but you're exactly correct. I even have a special track called Millionaire Money Problems. I've now had the privilege of coaching two billionaires and several multimillionaires. And you'd be surprised not only how much less happy they are, but how much more uh, subjective they are to status-related emotional issues. As in, you know, they're afraid that people are just friends with them for the money. They're so afraid of losing the money. They're afraid that there's this weird, irrational fear that the next paycheck will be their last. If you grew up not rich and became rich, there's such a pleasure of issues that comes with it. So it, it's its own set of issues, and I would love to talk about that today. I am excited. And how to get past that so that you can have fun with the money. 
So yeah, so tell us uh, that is so funny that you said that because that is one of the now I'm hardly I uh, would call myself rich today but one of the one of the issues that I was having today was waiting all day for these for a couple of business deals to come through and people to follow through with what they were supposed to do. And I'm sure that the business deals are going to come through but they just didn't the way they were supposed to yet. And so I was kind of sweating it out. <laughs> so. Marie, Marie, Marie. The fact that you mentioned that you were sweating it out and you used the word sweat. I didn't use it. You did. Yes. It means that you actually are not sure that they'll come through. There's a, there's a vibration inside you that still teaches you, don't believe it until you see it. And that's very, very common. It's very normal. Don't feel bad. You're wonderful. You're doing A-OK. But until you start to reside in complete faith, the money will come and it's not from here, from there, you will not start moving with abundance. And what I mean by this is this. This is the biggest thing that trips people up when it comes to money. You know what my definition of success in money is? Please tell us. It's being able to treat money the same way you treat breathing. In and out. In and out. In and out. It's easy. It's a reflex. It's supposed to come in. It's supposed to go out. It's supposed to come in. It's supposed to go out. And when you start to understand that, you're much, much more easy with it. You're much more comfortable with it. And you stop doing two kind of critical things that a lot of people do. Number one is to really be very, very mindful of what is and what is coming through. And if not, then I don't have. Instead, start thinking about this like you planted those seeds in the ground, right? Melanie, you didn't start working on those deals today. Very true. I, and not only did I start not start working on those deals today, the people came to me and offered me the the deals. So it's not even. <laughs> yeah, it means that you had planted even prior seeds that presented you with clients who were ready to buy. Exactly. So you planted the seed. You know that the, the the plant never comes out of the earth the day we plant the seed, or even a couple of days. Just let it grow and let it show itself to you when it's ready to show itself to you. And that's the first and most important thing that you can do. And the second thing that you can do is start focusing much more on what you have. And I know that that sounds like an annoying BS, right? Count your blessings. But really, count your blessings. You didn't pay for that gorgeous sunshine in Cape May today. You didn't pay for the Wi-Fi, most likely not much more than a normal fee. You certainly didn't invest the Wi-Fi. You're obviously already abundant. You're doing extremely well. You have enormous leverage, which means that if deals popped out of nowhere from here, they will pop out of nowhere from there. So ease into it. And as you do, you'll see this is just so incredible. You really become such, first of all, you become more relaxed, which is fun. But also, you become much more attractive to money. Now, you know what's incredible about what you just said is that the deals that I was not worried about these deals at, at all until they were offered to me. And then they were supposed to settle today. <laughs> the deals were supposed to settle today. And then I started worrying about them. <laughs> what Have is... you ever heard the fantastic phrase, Jesus take the wheel? Yes. Yes. Jesus take the wheel. Yes. You're, you're, Relax. that. Relax. Enjoy your life. They're coming. You're, you're so, that, that is so true. It's so right. And I, I wonder what that mindset, and I'm sure you have some insight into that, is about. The The deal came a couple of days, a few days ago. Somebody made an offer, said, listen, uh, we have this project coming up. We thought of the perfect person we wanted to do. We wanted to do the deal, and it was you. Uh, basically, name your price. I named my price. They said, we're going to cut you the check tomorrow. Send us the invoice. I sent the invoice. But then I didn't hear anything about my check getting cut. So now I'm like, oh, what happened? <laughs> which is, which is silly. We get to do is live coaching. And this is going to be so invaluable for everybody listening in because you are presenting one of the most common problems of our time. In fact, if you out there, listener, happen to have just gone on a really good date with somebody really, really hot, and then they didn't call you for three days, this answer is for you, too. It's exactly the same thing because what they would do, Melanie, in that case, in the dating case, is do exactly what you're doing. Start angsting. What happened? Did I stumble into some bad lighting? 
create stress. Stress is not a reflex. It's not inside our body. It's literally how we assign meaning to things. So it's a normal reflex. The reason you do it is because you grew up with very nice parents who probably told you to prepare for the worst constantly and who probably taught, taught you that things don't work out so easily in life and lots of things in life teach us that things don't work out so easily. But let's consider a couple of additional options just to ease you into this. Number one, it's Friday. Number two, it's really hot. They might be at the beach. Number three, something might have delayed the check. At, sometimes transactions take a little bit more time. Number four, there might be some additional loose ends that they need to tie up before they cut the check or con control the deal. Number five, Mercury might be in retrograde today and they're big believers in astrology. <laughs> Number six, somebody has a fight with their wife. My point is, if you decide to see that this has nothing to do with you, that this is coming to you, that this sum, if it's not coming to you from there, will definitely come from another, and it's just a question of moment, you'll relax about it and you'll let a lot more in. More importantly, you will have a nice Friday. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes perfect sense. I should not have been sitting here worrying about that all day. All day. It's, it's, it's complete. And, and listen, intellectually, I completely understood that I was being ridiculous, particularly since they came to me. I didn't even chase the deal down. They And these are people that I've dealt with before that I've never had an issue with before, that their word has always been perfect. It's not even a new client. They were like, we have a new job. They, you know, we have a new job for you. All the more reason to give them some flag. Exactly. Exactly. But you, yeah. but you, I think you're right about what you said as far as um, uh, uh, what could be the source of my issue, so to speak. So <laughs> I think it's you're the source of everybody's issue. I, do you know anybody who grew up with a positive self-consciousness? Do, do you know anybody who doesn't doubt that money will come? Nope, you're right. <laughs> That's right. This is a universal problem. This is why you get paid the big bucks. That's that's absolutely it, true. And that's it, exactly right. And that's if and it wasn't an issue, I would have nothing to offer. <laughs> Well, that, well, this is this is specifically why I brought it up because I figured I was not the only one who found herself in this situation as an entrepreneur when these when these types of issues come up. Now, what about when you are uh, someone who is and these types of things happen to me all the time, and I, I I'm one of these believers. I can tell you what the root cause of that of that by the way, if you want to go a little deeper, please let's if let's you feel like if you feel like diving a little deeper, we can dive a little deeper. Let's go. Let's do you it. Know what the real you know why, why we buy into all the doubts that we're fed by society and throughout our careers and why we start becoming so reluctant and why we start to freak out when just a teeny tiny thing doesn't happen exactly when we want it to? Why? It's because all of us, all of us, bar none, I have yet to meet someone in this lifetime who does not suffer from this to some degree. All of us have a certain degree of self-worth issues, which means we do not feel deserving of goodness without any exchange and automatically we will take it out on ourselves if something is delayed or not accomplished meaning if the deal doesn't close you instead of thinking well there's a million where that came from and i did my best and that was great you'll automatically think i somehow messed it up they found somebody better than me or something like that and is that a correct assumption that's a correct assumption that's the correct assumption with almost everybody, and that's a crazy assumption because you're phenomenal at what you do, and everybody should be throwing their money at you. However, most of us are not willing to say that out loud about ourselves ever because it sounds arrogant or ridiculous, unless we remember that we have some leverage around here. Did you start doing your job yesterday, Melanie? I did not, and, I, and I'll tell you the confirmation for that is, is regular because my, my business mind, my intellectual side, the part of me that knows what I'm doing and that understands business confirms what you're saying. Because anytime yeah. you, you quote a price and they don't blink and they say no problem, you know you could have got more money. And that happens. Well, yes and no. At the end of the day, if it's a fair exchange, it's a fair exchange. Right. You understand your value and you know what you're offering. Right. In fact, when they don't, when they do blink and they don't really want to meet you, you are not really going to bargain. You're just going to say, thank you very much, not for me, and move on. True. So it's always a fair exchange. You also know that if they do walk away uh, at this juncture, they're not particularly important. That doesn't mean that they're not important if they retain 
you as a, a colleague, but they're not really important. There's so much more where that came from. You didn't start working yesterday. And so what I'd like to start teaching everybody out there is your self-worth is so much bigger than this. Your tiny little tripping over miserly tiny incidents that don't matter in the grand scheme is what is just knocking you off your heels when it really should just be a, a pebble along the way. And why should that be? Do the inner work, understand your leverage, remember how valuable you are, stop with the perfectionism, drop the insecurity, and uh, and do anything that it takes to just get past it. Because when you do, Melanie, you get so much more focused on breaking it in from lots of different angles rather than continually um, fumbling over this one source, right? Yeah, now, I wa- yes, and I want to, you said a, a very important word, I think, is which is perfectionism. And I think anyone who attempts to be an entrepreneur probably has a little issue with perfectionism. <laughs> is so on point. It's powerful, isn't it? It's a, that's a powerful illustration because really, you know, I'm a visual person. So in my head, I just visualize this, this, this big old bully just beating up this little girl, you know, that, that, that is me. <laughs> I, I was, I've been working with so many very interesting people and uh, especially this week I'm featured on Coop. And I met lots of other practitioners who are like gluten free and they freak out when they eat gluten by accident. Or I remember uh, what I was like back when I was trying to lose weight in high school and how much I would beat myself up when I looked in the mirror and didn't like what I saw. And today I just think that talking to yourself this way is so painful and so atrocious. And unless we start taking it seriously, it's very, very detrimental to our well being. You know, I coach mostly men and very powerful men. And for them, it's even more difficult to understand that this is an important thing. But let's think about the ramifications. The, one of the many uh, implications of becoming very rich is, unfortunately, for many people, that they seem to think that they're trapping themselves into a lifestyle. And if they're trapping themselves into a lifestyle, particularly if they're the main breadwinners in their family or providers, <clears throat> if anything goes wrong, they feel so responsible. That's perfectionism. And it's so painful to have this incredible burden on your shoulders to constantly show up as if everything were perfect and everything were okay, rather than just say, you know what, I can't do this today, and I think that's okay. And I'm going to take a little break, and the whole world is not going to collapse. Don't you agree? I do agree. I do agree. But I think there is that pressure there to always be upbeat, to always, particularly, you know, if you do something like this, Two, there is always that there's always that balance between being authentic to like I, I find with social is particularly with social media. One time a couple of years ago, someone mentioned on my social media, they said that they felt that my life was glamorous. <laughs> and I still listen, and I don't mean I, I don't mean to laugh at that. I, I don't, because from their perspective, I, I suppose it it, it it is and was. But I also thought I am not doing a good job with authenticity in my social media if that is the perception, because there are many aspects of my life that are also not glamorous. And not that I need well, to. I totally get that. Then, don't, then do more than Zelfos. Right? The, the wonderful puppy. Do, do things that really do showcase who you are. But look, uh, my policy about this is I completely agree. I also think that one of the things that has made us hyper perfectionist is the terrible onslaught of Instagram and yes. people seeing other people. 
most hyper curated lives and for some reason buying into that nonsense when it is a hundred percent nonsense. Um, it's also just snapshots of people's lives. Like mine is filled with memes and then like occasional moments. That does not a life make. That just gives you a couple of opportunities to look at situations. But my policy around this has become complete and utter honesty. Period. The end. I have YouTube videos that I recorded a very long time ago when I was weary and going through a breakup and just talking about it. I spoke very openly um, recently about my mother is very sick, unfortunately. We are all human. We are all going through a human experience. And even I, a super trained coach, and believe me, I really don't tend to mess out for very long. I do practice what I preach. I'm still a human being in a human body going through a human experience. And you know, that's the biggest problem for most people because what's happening is, Melanie, they're conflating self-esteem with self-love. What we just talked about was self-love or self-worth, right? Right. Which is your ability to like yourself no matter what, to know your lovers no matter what, to speak to yourself with compassion no matter what. And self-esteem is very different from that. So many people believe that they have self-worth because they have self-esteem, but they are antithetically opposed concepts. Self-esteem depends on what you have and what you do and how you rank against society. But those are conditions, and conditions are flaky. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down, sometimes we close with deals, sometimes close deals take time. Sometimes we gain weight, sometimes we lose weight. And no matter who you are, not everyone will agree with you all of the time. So, self-esteem is useless. Self-esteem walks out the door the second you have a tiny little problem in your life. So I think that people should abandon it completely, should stop wearing those masks, should stop lying about how great they are all the time, and stop worrying so much about looking great all the time, and start really just showing up as who they are, because this gives you real power. And this, for me, as a practitioner, has allowed me to inspire more people to be who they are. Because just imagine if I was perfect all the time. My God, who would I inspire? Nobody. I agree with you 100%. And I, and I will tell you, when I when I first started um, doing my podcast and streaming live on Facebook and becoming a, a, a public figure, uh, someone had told, said to me, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, so authentic, so, so honest, so to speak. And I said, and, and this, this was after, you know, someone had mentioned how glamorous my lifestyle seems to be. And I said, you know what? I said, I really want to be more authentic. And, and at first I started taking their advice and I was walking around on eggshells and I was miserable. And I said, you know what? Exactly. I said, I'm going to just be myself. And I said, as long as I'm honest, I'm willing to own whatever it is that I post on social media. As long as I'm being completely honest and I'll own, I'll defend. And that's perfectly fine. That I I have no problem with that. It really is. And I mean, and listen, there's a lot of personalities and and, and people that I know um, that are in the business that I know personally. And if if people knew the real, the real, Uh, I'm sure you know the same. I know. But you know, it's these things that we're talking about weren't such enormous issues. Like, you know, so many people wouldn't be going broke. So many people wouldn't be financially illiterate. So many people wouldn't be huge Brene Brown fans. She resonates with yes. that because it is simply the heart of the matter. And I, I tell you, if people start to understand their self-worth, start caring about themselves more, start caring themselves with a concern for their money that is healthy and interested in wealth, in ease, in success, everything would go a lot better. I agree with you. Now, people may find it odd. Actually, you know what? Before I ask this question, I'm going to go to a commercial break, especially since I didn't take my take my first one. Let's, Get, do, it. let's do it. I'm going to take a brief break. My guest right now is Karen Eldad. She's, uh, she's a speaker, a coach, and she's doing a fine job encouraging us to live life enthusiastically, particularly in business. I'm so happy to have her on the show right now. We'll be back in a couple of moments. Credit cards or even new homes. Visit 
www.credit.biz today. That's mrcreditrepair.biz. Your credit repair is our number one priority. Making a living can be tough these days with so many jobs going overseas. If you love numbers and puzzles and want job security, you can become a tax specialist with an amazing six-month tax course from Tax Mama. Operate your own tax practice locally or anywhere in the world where there are American taxpayers. It's a great way to write off your trips to visit family for months at a time. Everything you need to pass the IRS three special enrollment examinations is included in this course. Visit irsexams.school. And if you need more than six months, that's okay. Take your time. You're in the course until you pass the exams or until you unsubscribe and reject Tax Mama's emails. Welcome to this week's Money Talk Minute. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. In this week's Money Talk Minute, we talk, should I rent or buy a home? If you're considering buying a home, here are some things to look at. Mortgage rates right now are historically low. They're hovering under 4%. So now would be a good time to buy if that's what you want to do. Another thing to consider is tax deduction. Mortgage interest, property taxes, discount points, all of these things could possibly be tax deductible. Now, what if you need a little bit more flexibility in your life because of your career? Maybe you might get a promotion or perhaps you're anticipating growing your family. In these kinds of instances, you may want to consider renting your home because your priorities may totally change. And that's this week's Money Talk Minute. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. Remember, Money Talk with Melanie airs live on Fridays, 5 p.m. East, 2 p.m. West via SHR Media and streaming live on Facebook. And we're back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. My guest this hour is Karen Eldad, and we are talking to her about living enthusiastically. I am so happy to have her on the show, Enterprise with Enthusiasm is uh is the subject matter and I, we're talking about ha- having enthusiasm in business i'm loving everything that you are saying about this and how our enthusiasm and how our attitude has an impact on our business well thank you and i'm loving your responses as well <laughs> and, and what i was about to ask you is how if you are a brand new entrepreneur and usually when we are thinking about Uh, starting a business, we're thinking about things like our business plan and we're thinking about, you know, uh, uh, doing our market studies and things like that, all all of these things. But are are there, is there a certain mindset that we should get ourselves, that we should get together, uh, a certain attitude that we should get together as well, that we should plan for? Oh, well, thank you. Because first of all, 40% of the United States, according to the IRS, is already reporting a side hustle. So everybody's an entrepreneur to some degree today. Right. I think that the, the only thing that really matters is to start understanding that the how does not matter that much because you have zero control over how things will unfold. Melanie, did you have a business plan for your business? I don't have a business plan for my business. <laughs> well, I did. How many entrepreneurs did I both have? And do you know how similar my business has turned out to my business plan? Not similar at all. 0.0%. Zero zero and then I could not see what happened in year two or year three. And uh, it's because I really allowed myself to roll with the punches, but also because I was much more committed to why I wanted what I wanted and to what I wanted than I was to how I wanted it to happen. When you lock yourself into how, when you lock yourself into the financial doodling, you really are limiting the greatness ahead. And I think all good business plans, therefore, should have an enormous amount of breathing room and room for scaling and room for adaptation and should be revisited all the time. They should be revisited as short-term goals because things change and because things pivot and because we must allow ourselves that room. And that's really the entrepreneur mindset because ultimately the entrepreneur mindset should be about one thing. Some people have called it grit. Some people have called it perseverance. Some people have got it called it resilience. I just like to call it passion, mostly because that's the only positive word you've just heard. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I want to persevere. I'm not a slave in ancient Egypt. I'm a happy, normal person. I'm going to go with passion. And if you understand that this is your passion, this is important to you, this means something for you, this means something for your family, you will persevere. You will figure it out. You will make everything figure outable. You'll be resourceful along the way. Setbacks will not collapse you. You see what I'm saying? 
I do. And you think, uh, you know what happens with my business and with my business plan? My show turned into a business the same way my consulting business turned into a business. I was serving people. My, my podcast started out as a hobby. And people asked me, uh, I a- asked me if I uh, took sponsors. And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. And then they were like, well, how much? And I was like, let me get back to you. <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, first of all, I launched my podcast last week. So I Excellent. I'm fantastic to hear and I'm very excited. And I wish myself the same success. But what you're really saying is I just did something because I love to do it. I did something that I was passionate about. And the people responded in kind. This has been the exact same experience that I've had with coaching. Coaching my business, just so you know, is two and a half years old. And did you hear the kind of clients that I just told you I had? I mean, amazing. Know, and Sandy and Dior and JP Morgan and Waypoint and Beyond Capital and Sierra Constellation Partners. These are big companies with big choices. And I believe that the reason is I was doing this because it was fun. Exactly. Exactly. I to do it anyway. And that's how mine started you out. Feel that. That's how my political consulting business started out. That's how my corporate training business started out. Somebody said, hey, do you teach? Because I'm a teacher. And someone said, hey, do you think you could come in and teach my company how to do Excel? And I was like, sure. And they were like, how much do you charge? And I was like, I, I, I don't know. And they were like, well, how about this an hour? And I was like, what? <laughs> I said, hey. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. I'll be there with bells on. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah but, I mean, let that be a message to everybody out there. Don't do it if you don't care about it. Don't do it if you don't love it. In fact, if you really want to be driven on purpose or on something like it, purpose is a very big word, but on just something like it, start asking yourself, what's fun? What do I really love to do? What do I have to offer? Those are really different questions than how do I make money? Exactly. And, and the money, the money really does come, but it is incredible. Like I was saying to you earlier, how you, I, I didn't start worrying it, but you know, these jobs start to come to you. And then for some reason, I, st- I start worrying about whether or not I'm going to get, why, why would I worry about whether or not I'm going to get paid when people were like, Hey, let me pay you for this. <laughs> hey, by the way, here's some money. It's an attractive mindset. If you want to talk about it vibrationally, you know, we are com- completely composed of energy it's just very low frequency. It translates as low frequency in a radio wave when you come from that desperate need for money. But if you really are here to love and here to joyfully co-create, uh, this is a very, very important vibration that's very attractive. Now, I know that some people out there, particularly entrepreneurs, will say, listen, give me the money, and when I don't need it and I'm more relaxed about it, then I'll feel the way you're telling me to feel. This woman is obviously crazy and rich. First of all, yes, I am. Thank you very much. But also, there's no need to take this out on me. You can find abundance exactly where you are. And if you can figure out how to survive, and I say this to all entrepreneurs, be practical. Get a day job. Get a side hustle that actually pays. Make sure that you secure a couple of clients before you jump in the water. Nobody wants you to start. Nobody needs you to start. And only from there, start to move because you will be far more attractive and far less needy. That's very true. That's very true. That 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 that's very true. You're 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 right about that. You'll be far more comfortable. You'll be far less worried about it. And, and for, for the for the love of Pete, I don't know why. I I think sometimes worrying can become a habit. It does because I do it. of course it is. It's a, it is a habit. Because I, I, there really is no need for me to worry about it. Like honestly. No need for me to worry about it. But I, I, I think sometimes you worry about the unknown. It's an important it's an important relationship. So I'm worried about did something happen with the relationship? How do I handle the relationship if something has gone wrong? All completely irrational thoughts. In election. Oh, no, they're not. They're actually not. I wouldn't call them irrational because they're very, very reflexive. What, you, what you're speaking about is, the uh, cognitive entrenchment or confirmation bias. It's a bias of the brain. And thank you for bringing it up because this gives me the opportunity to announce that what I just found out two days ago, which is I got a TED Talk, and I'm going to talk exactly about what you're talking about. Please do. I'm going to talk about... (laughs) Thank you so much. I'm going to talk about how the only thing 
that really trips us up in life is uncertainty. Uncertainty is the biggest problem for us physically. It's, it's the only thing that causes us pain. Think about it. Think about how logical and not irrational what you're describing is, Melanie. If a bear bites you right now in broad daylight, it's going to hurt and be pretty weird, but you will know what to do about it and the pain you can deal with. But if you're in a very dark cave and something bites you out of nowhere and you have no idea what's going on, can't even see what's happening to your hand, aren't you 20 times more freaked out? Definitely. So this is what's happening all the time. Our brain is trained and conditioned to help us to avoid pain. And that's why it does not like uncertainty. So it automatically covers you with bias, meaning it'll make you look for what feels comfortable and what feels safe. And what feels comfortable and safe to you, because you've practiced it more than your faith, is worrying. So what I'm asking you to do instead is try, just try to practice faith more. To practice soothing yourself, doing what we did in the first segment. Telling yourself nothing needs to happen right this second. Maybe they've gone on vacation. Maybe my check is in the mail. Perhaps other bigger things are happening. Maybe they're taking extra long because they want an even bigger deal to happen. And as you teach yourself to speak that way rather than worry, and the more you do it, the more you, it's just a question of practice, the easier you will be. I like that. I think that is a perfect way of thinking. I think you're right about that. <laughs> you know what? That Why not practice faith instead of practice worry? I mean, it, it is literally just as effective. I mean, it's also just as it's also just as rational. You don't know whether that things will fail and you don't know that things will go right. So why don't you choose just thinking what will go right? What is the harm here? Right. You can pick. I mean, you literally, literally can just it's choose. Just the same gamble. That is very true. I don't know. I don't know why in the world. <laughs> well, actually, I, I do I know. What's, what's really crazy about it, though, because actually it is a safer gamble to gamble on what's right. More than 20 years ago, Dr. Martin Seligman of the University of Pennsylvania did a groundbreaking study. He pulled optimists against pessimists, and he gave each one of them the exact same set of tasks. Before they performed the tasks, he made the optimists and the pessimists write out how they would perform on these tasks. The pessimists were always spot on. They said, this is how I'm going to perform. Then they performed the task, and they were accurate. The optimists always overshot. And as a result, you would think that the optimists were way off and just be acting themselves. But when he consistently measured them over a period of six months and a year, guess what happened? What happened? The optimists performed four to five times better than the pessimists. Of course. much better off thinking positive just because it's practical, just because it'll get you to go that much farther. Of course, of course. Yeah. That makes so much. Yeah. That makes so much more sense. And 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 I don't know. Now, and maybe you know the answer to this. What is it? Even when you know these things, what is it that causes you to forget? Is it that? Is it the 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 root cause of that mindset that makes you have makes you what they call it in religious circles makes you backslide? Into that, <laughs> into that no, negative no, Technically mindset. speaking, it's just practice patterns of thought. Ah. They've been thinking about this for such a long time that they have, that, that it's become almost a belief, it's different, it's the, and which becomes a behavioral pattern. Luckily, because of what I do for a living, I know that it's very easy to get you out of this. And it's simply just a series of conversations where we rationally approach your reasoned mind and prove to you, almost as a litigator would, a loving litigator, that what you're thinking doesn't make any sense and you're better off thinking differently because it'll make you happier, more successful at pretty much everything you do. It, you are better off thinking this way because it will make you happier, successful at pretty much everything you do. And you know what's funny about what you just said? And and I do, I, this I do practice when I think of it. If someone, you, you know that this old, it's really an old technique, right? If someone were to come to you with a similar problem, what would you tell them? And I would tell them exactly what you just told me. <laughs> I would... Yeah, but again, because of the self-work issue, we don't tend to think speak to ourselves as lovingly as we would to a stranger. Exactly. Isn't that funny? When I was a little girl, my dad used to say all the time in the car, Karen, would you rather be poor and miserable or rich and happy? And I would always say, rich and happy, dad, rich and happy. And I'm asking everybody 
out there who is so lovingly and normally tending to worry. Why don't you just think for one second that you'd rather be rich and happy? I like it. Rich and happy. Tell, please tell people how to get in touch with you, how they can buy any of your any of your books, avail themselves of your information or in your coaching. How can they do that? Thank you. With enormous pleasure. You Don't Know What You Don't Know comes out later this year after the TED Talk, which comes out in September. But for now, you can find all of my online programs and access to my private coaching program with me through www.kirinaldad.com. The podcast is called Coach. And you can follow me on Instagram at, at Coach Karen. Promise me that when you do your TED Talk, you'll come back. I'm a TED Talk junkie. I'm a total TED Talk nerd. I, I you know most people listen to like their favorite music on long bus trips. I, I literally just like binge TED Talks. Okay. I, I, I love okay. them. So I, I cannot will you wait. In September. That's a promise. Please do. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Melanie. Have an amazing day. Bye, Denzel. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Have a great weekend. That was the one and only Karen Eldad, who was talking to us about Enterprise with Enthusiasm. She was just a fantastic guest, fantastic author and coach. I'm so glad to have had her on the show today. In the next hour, we have a special treat, a good friend of mine, the one and only Jordan B. Rickards, who's an attorney and the mastermind behind conservativeopinion.com. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk Bernie and AOC uh, and how they want to turn credit cards into a welfare, their own personal welfare program and the post office into a welfare office. So I'm excited to have Jordan B. Rickards on the show. He's going to uh, call in during our long commercial break. So take a moment, listen to the commercials, go grab yourself a cup of whatever. You can grab yourself a, an adult beverage while I finish my iced tea. I'm going to play, play some commercials while you listen in and do that. I may even grab myself some more iced tea. And uh, before I go, I just want to remind you guys to check out my, I, I didn't drink any coffee today because it's way too hot for that. I'm drinking iced tea, but I want to remind you guys about biz. So Biz Social Personal Touch, they are responsible for this fantastic business, Diva Mug, and they have all kinds of wonderful products like this for you to send to your leads and, and friends and anybody that you want to reach out to. They're just totally awesome. And you should reach out to them. Denzel says hi if you hear him barking in the, in the background here in the studio. He says hi to all of you folks, my little dog, Denny. And Jordan B. Records is up next. He'll be, we'll be back in a few moments.
today, movers and shakers in the world of business. Listen in and discover financial truth on a global, domestic, and household scale. Uncover topics that will impact your wallet today and in the future. Money Talk with Melanie airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. East, 2 p.m. West, right here on SHR Media and High Plains Pundit Talk Radio. You can't afford to miss it. Welcome back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, broadcasting live via SHR Media from beautiful Cape May County, New Jersey. And it is the beautiful and very oppressively hot Cape May County, New Jersey today. Welcome back to the second hour. I'm so glad that you are joining me today. I have a very, very special guest for the second hour, the one, the only Jordan B. Rickards, who is the mastermind behind uh, an attorney extraordinaire, mastermind behind conservativeopinion.com, a very, very smart guy and handsome to boot. Um, oh. <laughs> well, you are. Thank you. <laughs> well, you are. I'm just saying. So, okay. uh, well, uh, like you didn't know this. Handsome. Well, I, just figured, I, just, I just figured you didn't have me on video today for some reason. It was almost, I felt, I felt bad about myself. It's... <laughs> No. no, yes, because of your utter hideousness. No, um, <laughs> no, no, he's handsome with luxurious hair, ladies. I'm just saying. Um, but <laughs> the luxurious hair is the plus. Just, I'm just, it's, it's just everything. Yes. So, and, and, and very smart, but the mastermind behind conservativeopinion.com. And if you've never been to conservativeopinion.com, you are missing out. Just saying, he has. He also has uh, his own own podcast. Is that called Conservative Opinion as well, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's my YouTube channel, ConservativeOpinion.com. But all my videos, I wind up putting on the main blog page, and the uh, the Facebook page now has almost thirty thousand followers. So you know, if you follow on the on the actual website or on the Facebook page or on the YouTube channel, it's all the same thing. Look at you. See, see what I mean? Mastermind, man. That's what I'm talking about. So, uh, so I put a link to the topic that we're discussing in the Facebook uh, page feed so that you guys could check out the article that we're talking about. But he posted an article about how uh, Bernie and AOC want to turn our credit cards into their own well, welfare system. It's just such an interesting article. But before we get into all of that, uh, please tell the audience just a bit about yourself besides the, the handsomeness and the luxuri- luxurious hair. Yeah, a salon quality <laughs> hair, actually, I like to call it. Um, so, <laughs> salon quality. Yeah, basically, you know, uh, I've been a conservative all my life, and um, I, I kind of feel like people who have a conservative 
to voice have an obligation to speak out. And I think one of the great things about you know the media today is it used to be just controlled by a, a few hand, you know a small handful of elites, but you know now pretty much anybody with a computer and enough time on their hands can you know really I think make a big impact, which is why I come on to your show because you know I think you're making an impact with what you're doing, and that's why I started uh, conservativeopinion.com because I kind of felt like you know there's whether you're on the left or the right, it seems like both sides have their own talking points, and they kind of want to define what is liberal, what is conservative for everybody else, and I just kind of want to define it for myself and give other people uh, a different perspective. So that's why I created conservativeopinion.com and, and the, the Facebook following. We do about, um, you know, I said we had 30,000 followers almost. We do about half a million impressions every month on that Facebook page. It's a very uh, lively and interactive community we have there. Uh, so, you know, if you're not on it, uh, you need to be on it and um, interacting with everybody else. And we have we have all kinds of, you know, people say that, like, conservatives don't have a sense of humor. We have, we have a great sense of humor. We just, it's just like, you know, we just can't tell our jokes in public because we get, get in trouble. So we create our own <laughs> Facebook page and we, can, we make fun of liberals over there, you know? Exactly. I posted one time on my Facebook page, I said, if you find our Facebook posts offensive, you should see what we PM each other. <laughs> Exactly. I'm like, if you saw the stuff that I don't post, you'd really be offended. If you well, that's, that's, actually, that's actually how I know how to filter something out. Like, if I'm if I'm going to write something, I say to myself, well, you know, George, that's a bit much. I'm like, okay, if I think that might be a bit much, then everyone else is going to think that's way too much. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna cut it off there. But it but, really you know, isn't it, that it, bad. You no, know, it, it, but here's the thing: it's not just what you say, though. It's also how you say it, like. I wrote an essay, um, it's one of the top ones on my page right now about, you know, how to solve the illegal immigration problem. And I basically said, you know, there's three things you got to do. Defend the border. Uh, you got to you gotta defund illegal immigration. You know, stop giving welfare benefits to illegal and illegal. And you have to have a deterrent. I mean, if you come here, there has to be a penalty for it, you know, including jail time if you're a repeat offender. Uh, and I remember I wrote it and it seemed okay. And then I started to film a video on it. And I was like, you know, I, I really just come across as like angry and mean spirited. And that's, that's, that's kind of counterproductive. So, you know, messaging is important. But my point is simply that, you know, uh, on my page and your page, we like to have a lot of fun. It's not, you know, we're, what we do is serious, but, you know, we do it, I think, in a fun way. And that's kind of the purpose of the community. Uh, I agree. I think we, I, but I think that. I don't know. I find that liberals, and, and this is not not to bash li- liberals, but I find that they're so they can be so um, emotional that they mm-hmm. don't find it find they don't get our sense of humor. Maybe well, they, don't, they don't want to. I mean, they see what they want. I mean, look, there are differences between conservatives and liberals that are measurable. I mean, conservatives, for example, we know empirically. Uh, uh, score much lower on codependency. We tend to be much more independent and we don't care what other people think. Liberals score much higher in codependency and they care about what other people think. You know, um, conservatives uh, uh, tend to like boundaries. Liberals tend to hate boundaries. Conservatives tend to be less creative than liberals. Believe it or not. Liberals, uh, there are reasons they're in the arts. You know, they tend to be able um, to think of lots of different things at once, which makes them creative, whereas conservatives are better at thinking of one thing and thinking of it in great depth, which means that we uh, develop better policy, which is why we don't have you know silly ideas like socializing the entire credit card markets, for goodness sake. Try to, try to sit. Exactly. So, like, you know, that's what you're saying. I mean, they don't, the liberals, it's not that they don't have a sense of humor, it's that they don't have a sense of humor about the self. Okay, and since every their entire world is based on what offends me and what doesn't, okay, they go out of their way to be offended by things that aren't just when it uh, challenges. I think a lot of their assumptions. It's very, it's extremely. <laughs> it, it's, it's, there's such things extremely true, but it is. It's extre- it's, it's absolutely, and it's extremely true. And we don't even mind disagreeing with each other because we know that we are disagreeing with each other based on facts, and we respect. <laughs> the fact that we disagree with each other. It, it, we're like, okay, we agree on these facts, but we disagree with what those facts mean. We're not emoting. Well, and, yeah, I mean, you and I can disagree on things. You know, here's, a, here's part of the problem. We've become so, so relativist in this country that, uh, and we want to believe in equality, that we tell people, well, everyone's entitled to their opinion, and we almost, almost like saying, well, everyone's opinion is equal. But it's not. I mean, an opinion that comes from a place that's not rooted in fact, that's not rooted in uh, knowledge and education, is not entitled to the same 
level, level of deference as one that is. So even if I have respect for you as a person, not you specifically, but someone as a person, I'm not going to respect someone's opinion that isn't rooted in reality. I mean, you want to see something ridiculous. Go watch, like, for example, go on to YouTube and watch uh, Ma's death on Bill Maher's show. Bill Maher every now and then has people who are in no way qualified to speak on policy issues on his show. And oh, most of most stuff that and, his his, his yeah, mo- and, most stuff. He was debating. He was debating Middle Eastern terrorism with Salman Rushdie and Christopher Hitchens. What? Who are like elite level experts in this, and and Maz Def didn't even know the difference between the Taliban and, and Al Qaeda. But he was able to get the audience to applaud just by saying, "Okay, well you have your opinion, and I'm entitled to mine." Yeah, but your opinion is rooted in ignorance. It's not entitled to any deference like these other guys are. Are you? So, so, are that's you? That's the problem with being so hung up on equality is that if we gotten to the point where we're, we're not able to say anymore, no, not every idea is equally valid. So are you suggesting that if you have more knowledge on a subject, that your opinion should be weightier than someone who does not have as much knowledge? Well, at a minimum, <laughs> if you have more knowledge on a subject, you should be able to articulate an intelligent opinion better than the other person. Now, if you can't, then you've got your own issue. But you should be able to defend an opinion um, more convincingly than, than someone who, you know, just shows up and doesn't know the difference between, you know, uh, two very different groups like, like uh, Mon Death did. And, and I think what, you, what you've just articulated is, is a, another really big difference between liberals and conservatives, which is, you know, liberals believe that someone like Mon Death's um, opinion is equal. And why shouldn't it be? Because it's his opinion and he's an equal human being and his opinion should be just as valid, even though he has no idea what he's talking about. Yeah, but that, that, that's one of their internal contradictions because they say that, you know, we're all equal, we're all equally capable, this and that. But then they all favor socialism, which basically asserts that, you know, half the country can't take care of itself. And we have to, we have to rig basically an entire economy because, well, kids are going to take out student loans. And people are going to buy houses they can't afford. And people are going to, you know, run up bills on their credit cards they can't pay back. So socialism basically says, you know, we need government to be your parent because so many people are going to not make adult decisions. Oh, but by the way, everyone's brilliant. So I mean, this internal contradiction, but both of those things can't be true. But know? by the way, everyone's brilliant. <laughs> and Katina in the Basie chat says, I think that's true. Uh, but the way, you can tell you can tell that you and I have been teachers before because you know I, I taught in a community college for a while. I know that you teach too, and and we have to deal with students who say silly things in class that are in no way rooted in what we are teaching or in, in, in anything that anybody taught. In no way rooted in knowledge, but they're eighteen or nineteen years old. They've been told their whole lives that basically you'll get a D in this class if you just show up and, and articulate you know your thoughts. And then they expect to be treated like people who actually get things right on the test. Right. And then they show up in our classrooms and we're like, wait, no. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then you and I are the ones to get bad reviews. Oh, exactly. Wait, don't tell me you got bad reviews this this, this semester. I uh, Last semester, I think I had one student put up like six bad reviews on Rate My Professor. And then some other students fought back and put up like 20 good ones. But it was just, it, it was all silliness. It was, I think what it was, I had some students who complained that I was giving multiple choice tests because she said, well, if it's a multiple choice, then I have to know the right answer. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the rule. You have to know the right answer. Like, well, you don't even. You can just guess, and one out of five times you'll be right. And she's like, well, I'd rather write an essay where I can just, you know, uh, ramble on and get some extra points for writing. I'm like, don't think that I'm going to give you extra points for making me read garbage. Well, she you know? said... So she has the AOC uh, theory behind learning, which is that, didn't she say something like, you don't have to necessarily be steeped in right, rightness as long as... You know, she, said, she, said, uh, she said she doesn't care about being factually right as long as she's morally right. There what you go. Doing, what you're doing is moral if you don't know the facts. Thank this you. Is problem. See, this is why Democrats and liberals in general are able to come across as so virtuous because they're able to just take positions they should contradict each other, but if they just take it one at a time and they don't care about the consequences, then they can sound compassionate. Oh, it's, it's incompassionate. Um, uh, it's discompassionate not to, not to let all these poor people into the country. Okay, fine, that's true, but doesn't that have a cost? Doesn't that, doesn't that impact your ability to provide free health care for everybody? Doesn't that impact your ability to provide free college tuition for everybody? Well, you know, they don't even get to that because they just go to the next topic. Oh, it, it, it's compassionate give everyone free health care. It's compassionate uh, uh, to give everyone free college. It's compassionate to pay off everybody's loan. But wait a minute. It, yes, it, in an abstract sense, each one of those things is compassionate. But things cost money. Resources are limited. Okay? You can't just look at one or not the other. They complain, for example, 
about lack of housing at the same time they impose housing restrictions that prevent new housing from being built. They complain that you have a half a million Americans who are homeless every night. At the same time, they got 20 million illegal aliens here, all of whom are requesting uh, welfare benefits, many of which are getting plus benefits that are designed for Americans. So they never, since they never concern themselves with how their contradictions cost the other side of their argument, they're able to come across as compassionate. And since we're the adults in the room saying, wait a minute, you know, the more taxes you raise, the, the more you're going to hurt the economy and the more you're going to hurt the ability to do all these things you want to do, since we're the ones that have to say no, then we're the incompassionate ones or discompassionate ones. Oh, uh, the parents are always the bad guys. The parents, <laughs> right, right. Nobody likes the adults in the room. Nobody likes the adults in the room. So that, that brings us to, we can pivot to your article that you wrote about the Loan, the loan Shark Prevention Act, which really, just the, the name alone is well, incendiary. It's got Loan Shark in it, and that's me. It's you people, nobody likes sharks, for goodness sake. <laughs> you know why I wrote this article? Let me tell you what it's about first. Then I'll tell you why I wrote it, okay? Really quickly, the Loan Shark Prevention Act does two things. It says that banks won't be allowed to charge uh, more than 15% interest on credit cards. And it, it also says that people will be allowed from now on to cash payday loans at the post office. And then when, I, when they default, the post office is basically just going to eat the loss, okay? And the reason I wrote this essay is because even though on its face that is just an indefensibly stupid idea or two <laughs> stupid ideas from, frankly, two very stupid people, okay, <laughs> I saw a lot of Republicans were suddenly like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Why should banks charge more than 15% interest? Well, because these interest rates aren't arrived at arbitrarily. They have to factor in risk. If people represent a greater than 15% risk that they're not going to pay back their loans, then you can't have the, the interest rate limited to that. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and they don't understand that uh, banks are not charities either. That what they say is, well, if the bank gets the loan from the Federal Reserve, which only charges the bank 2% interest, yeah, but you've got to pay that back. And, and what, the, what the effect of this is going to be is if someone's risk profile demands, say, a 25% interest rate, which basically means they have crappy credit, right, with a history of non-repayment, okay, and you can't charge them 25% or whatever it is, then one of the two things is going to happen. Either everybody else's rates are going to go up, to account for that person getting their rate at, at uh, below market value, or that person just isn't going to get the loan, which is fine with me, except if you read the hidden subtext, what Bernie says is these people need that money. They are desperate for that money. Well, if they're so in need of it, why are you creating a system where they're not going to get it unless what you're going to do is force the rest of us to pay higher interest rates to subsidize? That's what's going to wind up happening. Everyone else's interest rates go up. I see him complaining now about uh, the Amazon credit card charge of 25% interest. I just took one out today because what it actually does is Amazon gives you 5% cash back, so it's negative 5% interest, and then 2% on everything else that you don't buy on Amazon. So it's actually a negative interest rate card. They pay you to use their card unless you don't pay them back, and then they start charging you interest. Right. What is wrong with that? It's not for everyone. If you don't like the rate, you're an adult. Just don't take it out. But don't take it out and then turn it around and complain about predatory lending. Nobody's holding a gun to your head. Well, wait a minute so now. Is you're going you're gonna to put me in a position where I can't get the credit card at the rate I want because because you can't be trusted to make adult decisions. Well, now, everybody's not an adult, though. It's a nanny state. And well, if you're, 18, if you're 18 and you're allowed to vote, you're an adult. Okay, they're not giving out credit cards to children. Well, but well, what about the argument though, Jordan, that if people don't pay back their loans, then it just gets written. I love this phrase. It just gets written off. So when it gets written off, that money just goes into the ether, right? Like nobody, no, no, nobody. Pays. Off. No <laughs> First of all, what they do is declare bankruptcy, so the bank has to take a loss and they factor that in with higher interest rates for everyone else. It's no different than in healthcare when people go to the hospital and then they just don't pay, and then the rest of us have to pay, you know, more for our hospital visits. I mean, it's it's no different. So this idea that that you know the money it just kind of grows on trees and who cares because as Bernie Sanders says, well, bankers wear three piece suits. What's well, that's your economic argument? <laughs> bankers wear three piece suits. What the heck does that even mean? But no bank has ever gone out of business. No, this is because they they've invested it all on their three piece suits. Yeah, right. And and we saw what we saw what happened when in the financial crisis, you know, you thought the housing crisis was bad. Okay, the housing crisis is 
nothing. That, that would involve like 5% more people defaulting on their mortgages. We've got so much personal debt in this country, and now you want to rig the credit card markets where you're going to basically say, okay, you have to give credit to people who don't deserve it. You can't, you can't charge them rates high enough. And I'll tell you what's coming next, Melanie. I mentioned this in my essay. Is they're, they're really going to start going to war on credit scores, which they've already said are racist. Okay, they already manipulate credit scores by basically, you know, wiping off uh, bankruptcies after only a few years. So, you know, lenders don't get as, as strong an idea of who they're lending to. Wait they're a minute. They're manipulating these credit scores even more soon, just like they're manip- manipulating the SAT scores to account for, like, that stupid adversity rating. Oh, we're going to give you an extra point because uh, uh, because your high school has a bad graduation rate and your talent is overrun with drugs. They're going to start doing something like that with credit scores, too. They're, they're not going to call it that, but you watch. That's, that's the next thing they're going to charge. The adversity rating? The, I, 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 I did. I heard about the adversity rating and, and I, 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 I had to give it to him now because it was a really slick way of, of, of getting the race rate of getting the, uh, the, the racial, uh, the race card in there. I had to well, give what it. Happened, what happened <laughs> with the, the, the precursor to that is a bunch of Asians started suing these Ivy League schools for discrimination because they were being held to higher standards and weren't getting in when they deserved to. Right. Okay. And so, and so obviously they're, they're using their SAT scores as proof of this. So ETS, which makes the SATs, doesn't want to start losing all their business, all the business of all these uh, schools. So they created an adversity rating so that schools could still use the SATs and still discriminate against Asians and other people with better with better scores. Instead of actually addressing the root cause of the problem, like why are certain groups doing more poorly? Why do we trap the poorest, uh, uh, most disadvantaged people in these failing public schools when we can send them to successful schools for less money? Well, we don't want to address that because, God forbid, those people actually succeed and then they become Republicans. Okay? <laughs> so we have, to keep, we, we have to keep them trapped. Okay, we're not going to address their problems. We're just going to give them basically SAT welfare. Okay, and just like we do with everything else. SAT welfare. I love that. But that's exactly. Well, you and I, you and I already have to do it. I mean, I think I spoke to you about this. Don't you have to? Don't you have to give minimum grades to your students? Like you can't give zeros on certain things when they don't hand in their assignments. You got to give them fifty. Yeah, 50s and 55. And this is what people don't understand. We have now minimum grades to prepare them for the minimum wage lifestyle. It's a minimum wage for grades now. (laughs) But that's exactly what it is. And what people don't understand is that these are marking period grades, and we're talking about percentage grades. And that right, is, right. And, and and we're also talking about, not to get way off topic here, but we're also talking about the fact that great, that these grades are attached to um, graduation attrition. And, right, and, right. and so my argument has been for a long time, and I'm writing a book about this, is that it, it, it's highly illegal when we are cooking the books and that is attached to money. And I don't see how that is not illegal because everywhere else on the planet, it's illegal when you cook the books and it's attached to public money. Well, and it's also it's, it's also another contradiction in the sort of public school racket where they cook the books, they do anything to get kids to graduate, even those that don't bother showing up, because they have to maintain a certain graduation level to get money. But they also have an economic incentive to maintain the poverty level, because the last thing they want to do is have, is have their communities come out of poverty and then they stop getting money. If you look at New Jersey where you have like Hoboken. Hoboken you have these condominiums, like everything in, in Hoboken costs a million dollars, and they keep getting money because the students keep failing. So God forbid the students start doing well, okay, and all of a sudden they get that money taken away, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, you start to you start to cutting back, start to cutting back on teacher salaries. Jordan, so you have this perverse incentive program where the more schools fail, the more money they get, but they yet they still have to cook the books to keep the graduation rates up high enough. And so what they wind up doing is they just shoveling kids through who can't pass basic proficiency tests, so they get into colleges, which then have to have remedial programs, okay, so they can finally teach kids the things they should have learned in eighth grade. Uh, do you do you know how they make up time in some schools? Do you know how uh, they make up? Ahead. They have them sit in detention on Saturdays to literally make up school time, so they're not being taught anything. They are literally sitting in. They are literally sitting in school to to do what did they call it? Credit completion time. Oh well, when when I was in juvenile court, <laughs> I used to be a juvenile prosecutor, and one of the things when we, you'd see these kids that were just like totally incorrigible, right? I mean, like I'm not talking about somebody who does something one bad a semester. I mean, kids that just go to school and ten times a day they're in the principal's office, and they would be sent to these reform. 
reform schools. And the funny thing about those is no learning would take place. They were just like holding schools, just like warehouses for these kids. They, they turn on videos. You would get like these stacks of disciplinary uh, reports, you know, every other week. Like, you know, so-and-so uh, hit the teacher over the head with his own book and then threw the teacher's books out the window. So-and-so was gambling on his phone all day long. You know, so-and-so uh, you know, tried to choke another student with his belt. I mean, it's like the, all the same students. And after, after four years of that, they not only quote-unquote graduate, they get a diploma from the school they were kicked out of. So if you were kicked out of North Brunswick School to go to like Bedlam High School, whatever it's called, where, you know, you're just sitting in school all day and, and throwing things at people and not learning, after four years, because you've turned 18 and we have to get you through the system, now you get a diploma from the North Brunswick High School that kicked you out four years earlier. Exactly. So, I mean, it's just, the whole system is completely rigged. And to pretend it doesn't have, this contributes to all kinds of income inequality. It contributes to, to inequality in terms of who goes to jail and doesn't. Substance abuse inequality impacts family inequality. I mean, racial inequality. All kinds of inequalities are directly traceable back to this terrible, uh, basically, public school system that, that basically got this totally perverse incentive program where learning is the last priority whatsoever. I, I, I listened, I was in a meeting the other day and I couldn't, and I, I wrote this down because it's going in my book. <laughs> I, I write down all kinds of things and email myself all kinds of things that are going in my book. And it, w- one of the things I heard someone say in, in a meeting was that there was the special program. And because of this program, 13 more kids were able to graduate because of this program. But this was the key in what this administrator said. And because of this, since these kids were able to graduate, you see it benefits us too. Not it benefits the kids, not that it was a great help to the kids. It was a great benefit to us. And I thought to myself, that was not a Freudian slip. That was just exactly what the goal was. The goal well, was know, to if, help if, us. If the kids are graduating more because they're learning more. That's great. But if you're just breaking the system, then you're producing greater problems. It's like it's like all these liberals complain about prisons being overcrowded. You know, uh, we have three million people in prison. Okay, well, what is the right number first of all? Like you just you have this instinctively high number that makes you squeamish, and so they want to reduce the prison population. Okay, that's great if you're reducing the prison population by reducing the crime rate. But if you're just saying, that, no, we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have the same level of crime. We're just going to release more people and have them serve shorter sentences so there's more criminals on the street. Then you're just making the problem worse. You know, you're, you're, cha- you're rigging the number, but you're not solving the problem. And getting back to what you were saying, Jordan, is the, the problem is starting inside the public schools as well. We have the same, we, I, I had the same problem you you have this this uh trend that's going on now with not writing up with african american students being disproportionately written up um than their white well, counterparts okay well that, let's, that's not true that that doesn't factor in behavior though well that's just looking at the wrong the wrong numbers thank you exactly and and so <laughs> and, and so what i heard a, an administrator say was you have to consider their environment and where they come from before you write them up and i'm well, like <laughs> Thank you. Racism is the racism of low expectations. Exactly. Exactly. And so now what you're doing is so you're you're consider so let's just go with that theory for a moment. You're considering their environment and where they come th- from and so you're making this this behavior acceptable and you know where they end up in prison. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, or in welfare or minimum wage jobs. I mean, but what's amazing is that when we get them out of those schools and into like public charter schools you know, that are actually held to account, those same students who are failing in the public schools all of a sudden start succeeding. You know, so it, it's not like it's this, it, you know, if when you have a student who has behavioral problems, okay, you address the individual student. But when a school year after year produces nothing but kids who are incapable of doing college level work, then it's the system's fault. You don't blame the kids for that. You blame the system. And yet, you know, the answer for everything is, well, You've got this school that's failing. Let's just reward that school with more money. So, you know, the schools that succeed lose out because they get less money, and the schools that fail get rewarded with more money. And and, and you wonder why things are screwed up. Well, he- listen, let's be honest. Democrats have a vested interest in, in maximizing the number of people who fail at life so that they are dependent on the government. 
Oh, you, you're, you're not lying there. You're, you're telling the absolute truth on that no, I'm one. Going, I'm going off on a rant is what I'm doing. <laughs> That's okay. It's perfectly fine. I don't even know what topic you brought me on here to discuss, actually. I forgot like 20 minutes ago we were talking about. <laughs> well, one thing led to an, listen, conservativeopinion.com is the overarching topic because right. I, I want more people to go to your website and, 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 and go to your YouTube channel because I think it's, it's fantastic. But the, the original topic we were talking about is the welfare state that Bernie and AOC are perpetuating. So I think that it's all related and I'm perfectly fine with your rant. Well, you know, you know what's ironic about the whole, I mean, there's a lot of things ironic about the welfare state, but if you listen to one of Bernie's speeches, he always loves to talk about how the economy is rigged. It's like his favorite thing to say, oh, the economy is rigged. His entire ethos is about how he wants to rig the economy. <laughs> show, me one, seriously, isn't it? It show is. me one market, show me one thing he wants to leave alone. It that's is. The only part of the economy that's really unfair are the parts that the government has rigged, like the student, uh, like the healthcare industry or, or the student loan industry or, or the housing market. I mean, as the, the where the government stays out of the rigging business, things go pretty well. And the government starts rigging things, and things go badly. And Bernie Sanders says, the problem in the world is the economy is rigged, so elect me so I can rig it. I mean, it's like my head is spinning. How is yeah? How is paying off everyone's student loan not rigging the economy? How is providing health care for everyone in the entire world not rigging the economy? And, and, and not just that. It's not just, it's not just paying for it. It's, it's setting all these different price controls. Here's how much you can charge for this. Here's how much you can't charge for that. You know, if you want to hire workers, here's how much you must pay them. Uh, if you're going to pay for something, here's the most amount you should be ha- you should have to pay for. It. That's really what bankrupted Venezuela. It wasn't just government spending. It's it's all these um, it's it's all the market manipulation of prices. For example, they said, well, um, food is too expensive, so you can't sell food above a certain price. Well, the people growing the food just stopped growing it, and, and what they did grow, they sold on the on the black market to other countries. So you create a food shortage, and now people had to eat zoo animals to prevent from starving them. The average Venezuelan has lost like 18 pounds because price controls prevent people from buying food. And on the other end, 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 uh, end of the spectrum, they say, well, uh, just as people are paying too much for food, people aren't paying enough for labor. So we're going to raise the minimum wage higher and higher. Okay, that means more people out of work. Okay, so it's not just subsidizing things. It's that whenever you set a price that's above market value, you create a surplus, in this case, a surplus of labor. Whenever something you think is priced too high and you, you demand that it not, not be priced that high, you create a shortage of that thing. In that case, food. In this case, what we see in, in, in America, it, it, in terms of, for example, Bernie Sanders and his credit card thing, uh, if, if you're setting the price of money below market value, in this case, 15%, you're going to create a, a shortage of credit. And when credit markets dry up, that's exactly how you cause recession. Every recession we've ever had in this country has been the result of credit markets drying up. And, and that's exactly what you're going to do when you start rigging how much interest banks can charge. So what you're saying is, is that we should let the free market decide. And, and <laughs> if you don't, if you don't, if you think the rate is too high to take out a credit card, don't, don't take, take it out. out. If you're going to take one out, you're responsible to pay it off, period. And, you know, Melanie, there's, there's something called moral hazard. Okay, and that is when you keep covering for people's mistakes, okay, when you keep telling people you're going to pay for their mistakes, they're more likely to make that mistake. When you keep covering people's costs, they're more likely to maximize that cost. Okay, so so the best way to maximize bad behavior is to always say the government is going to bail you out of it. So I don't believe in a bailout economy. I believe in an economy based on personal responsibility. Okay, that's not to say... It's not to say you can't have welfare programs when people fall on hard times, but it's absolutely to say that you can't establish welfare as a lifestyle and socialism as your as your guiding economic principle. Jordan, that, that doesn't work anywhere because you're dealing with people. That doesn't work with what we talked about earlier. It doesn't work with schools. It doesn't work with parenting. It doesn't work with government. It doesn't work anywhere because the overarching thing no, it is... Works one it, it works one place. It works, it works in politics. You can say economically indefensible things like these clowns say, and nobody challenges them on it, and they win elections. I mean, just look at New Jersey. Oh, gosh. Can we not look at New Jersey, where we both unfortunately well, live? <laughs> where we both 
unfortunately resign. How is it that we live in this red state? And how is it that that, that we live in a, in a state where the governor who will literally look in the camera, tell everyone that we're going to raise your taxes, we're going to make it a sanctuary state, and this man absolutely wins the election? Well, because, I, I, because so many people, he wins the election because he dominates areas where people aren't paying the taxes. He dominates, he dominates areas where, see, in New Jersey, the real problem is the property taxes. True. He gets destroyed in all the suburbs. He, gets, he wins in the cities where you have all these subsidized renters. True. He, first of all, aren't really paying the property taxes except indirectly to the rent, and the rent is being subsidized anyway. True. So what do they care? Right. You know, so, so if that's the group. If you're on the receiving end of socialism, I mean, it's great when you're getting your checks, for example. You don't care about the average homeowner in New Jersey who's blowing 7000 a year to live in a very small home, and then on top of his income taxes and everything else, you know. Exactly. And, and, and you, there are many people that, that and, and I've run into them who think that they didn't get a tax cut with the Trump tax cuts because their property taxes are so high. And then you have to explain to them the difference between, you know, if your federal taxes, your state taxes and your property taxes and explain that. No, what really well, got you. It's not just that. It's <laughs> they think they didn't get a tax cut because their refund is smaller. OK, yeah, but less is being taken right. all along the way. Your refund is not what you're paying in taxes. Look at the form. Right. But, you know, getting about how you know everyone can vote but not everyone pays taxes look at look at the, the school system in Camden. now it's 200 million dollars a year in their school system so you're basically saying it, it costs you a hundred million dollars to graduate in a year one student who could do college level work okay? oh my gosh every year though they go where do they get their money from for that school district 90 percent of it comes from out of out of district taxpayers right i think i think they get 300 million from from the state and then 30 million they pay themselves and yet every year they go to the ballot box and they vote for a higher school budget. Because what do they care? They're not paying They're it. They're not right? paying it, right. The taxes, get, the taxes get imposed on the rest of us. So if, if the person demanding the benefit isn't the one paying the cost, you can you can expect two things, high cost and a shortage of benefit. No, you're right about that. And, and I, I can't believe that, that that's stunning. That's stunning that they're able to get away with that, but they're, they're trying to do something similar in Atlantic City, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it's basically all of these Abbott districts. You know, in New Jersey, years ago, we had the Supreme Court case, New Jersey Supreme Court case called Abbott, which basically said, look, we've got 35 school districts that are just total failures, okay? And as long as they're failures, we're going to make sure they get tons of money. So you get like these schools like Asbury Park. They get close to forty thousand dollars per year per student, which is like two and a half times what you get in a suburban school, to continue to fail. Well, what's happened in the thirty years since the Abbott decision came down is the same thirty-five school districts are still Abbott districts. For all of that money, they're still failing. So it's not like it solved any problem because the moment these school districts start to succeed, they'll lose the money. So that's so the they want. right. So where, where, where is the incentive to do better? <laughs> You know what? I want to pivot a little bit on uh, to what they because it remind it reminds me of what they talked about at the debate last night. Um, only because the Abbott districts also tend to have so many uh, students that are uh, are not here legally, and uh-huh. about how the everybody on the stage, and of course Kamala Harris tried to walk it back a little bit today, uh, said that they would be willing to pay for health care for all the uh, no, illegal. No, no. They said they'd be willing to have everyone else pay for it. That's very true. They didn't say they would pay for it. Now, Kamala Harris tried to walk it back and say she thought that they that they, she meant uh, their their personal uh, insurance, that they would that they didn't want to. Uh, they didn't want to get rid of her private insurance. They said, who wants to get rid of their private insurance? I think two people raised their hand. Who wants to pay for illegal Im- immigrants? Everybody raised their hand that yeah. they wanted to pay for illegal immigrants to have, to have health insurance. And I thought... And, and, also, and also maximize the number of people who hear and grant asylum to everyone based only on, on one question. Do you come from Latin America? And if the answer is yes, congratulations, you have asylum and you can stay here. I mean, this is part of the problem. I understand you want to be compassionate, but you got to be 
compassion to everyone else who's here as well. Okay, we have a country for a reason. All right, now listen, when it comes to immigration, first of all, I don't blame the kids whose parents brought them here. Okay, and I have for a long time advocated for a comprehensive solution that says, look, if your parents brought you here and you graduated from our high schools or you've know, gone to our schools for three or four years, whatever, you know, I'd rather have you succeed in life and be a ward of the state and be on welfare the rest of your life, okay? And as part of a comprehensive immigration reform, I'm willing to favor something like the DREAM Act. And I'll tell you, Melanie, I did a poll on my blog the other day, which got like 800 responses where I said, look, would you favor, to all these conservatives, would you favor an immigration compromise that gave legal status to the illegal immigrants who are already here in exchange for secure borders and cutting off future illegal aliens from welfare? And the answer was like 90 to 10, it was yes. Okay, all we want is secure borders and no more welfare for illegals, and we are fine with having a compromise here. So I think we're actually being pretty reasonable about this, but you can't have it both ways. You can't say, let's maximize the number of people who are here because, you know, we basically want to turn our immigration system into a global anti-poverty program paid for by the American middle class, okay? And then at the same time, uh, say, you know, maximize the number of people who are here and maximize the benefits too so everyone can have everything for free. I mean, if you can't see how this is going to overwhelm the system immediately, then honestly, you shouldn't be participating in our democracy. I hate to say that, but it, it, you need a certain, like, baseline level of intelligence to, to, to be making important decisions like this. And then voting is an important decision. And you're certainly right. I mean, you're talking about very simple math. But here, but here's the the other thing about that. The only thing that concerns me about the whole kids who came here them, themselves, and, and this is from a, a public school perspective. Now, you teach on the college. We both teach on the college level, but I teach in the public school. And I've had classrooms where the kids spoke zero English. And I, I will tell you from a practical standpoint, some of these kids are definitely adults. I'm going to tell you that yeah. some of these. I'm, I'm telling you, and well, that's, true. that's true in juvenile court too. I had kids. You've who, had this. They kept they kept changing their birthday every time we saw them. They'd be prosecuted as juveniles and not adults. Thank you. Some of these kids are some of these kids are definitely are definitely adults. They speak no English. They come from different um, Spanish speaking countries. So it's it's not even a matter of oh why can't you just learn to speak Spanish? Well, how many dialects of Spanish did I learn to speak? You know what I mean? Like it, it's not it's not that simple. I dealt with kids who were born in the United States and only speak Spanish and not English. Ridiculous. I mean, because the community's become so insular. I mean, that's how bad this has gotten. And, and, I mean, and but the language thing, the language thing, I get it. That has certain challenges. But the bigger thing is, you know, you just it, you you just can't treat our immigration system like an anti-poverty program. I was having this debate on my blog the other day, and some woman said. You could, I, I'm in favor of bringing in as many highly qualified, resourceful, educated, highly skilled immigrants as possible. This woman said, okay, but fine, but what do you do with the guy who's living in Guatemala who only has like a fifth grade education and no skills, no money? I said, well, I think that's what you do. You keep them on the other side of the border. Yep. I, I mean, I'm sorry, but that person, you know, one of those people is one thing, but when you multiply that by lots of people, it creates an immense burden on everyone else. It was Diane Feinstein. The, the Democrat senator from California, who not long ago said the, the American taxpayer cannot be Mexico's welfare system. Chuck Schumer said the same thing four years ago. Barack Obama, too, so did Nancy Pelosi. And now all of a sudden they realize that they can't win the middle class vote anymore. And so they're going out of their way to tax the electorate with what, with what they think are people who eventually will vote for them because they're going to need the welfare program. Yep. And, and and I'll tell you my other concern from a classroom perspective is that, that not only do they come in, we don't know whether they're adults or kids, but they also don't come in with the same vaccinations and things like that. And I have a family member, a close one, who has a compromised um, immune system because of an illness that he has. And I, I'm oh, yeah. the irony of that, very what concerned. If, your, if, if one of your American students refuses to get a vaccination, they can't come to a school. Right. We, we bring kids in from across the border who've never been vaccinated for anything. We put them right in. Exactly. So this is the, like bizarre world. Exactly. And so that's what worries that that's the biggest thing that worries me the most. I'm like, what if I contract something and bring it to my rel my relative? It can be wanna, death dealing. I don't want to. I don't want to start demonizing people the way and, and you know the way President Trump does sometimes. Saying, well, look, you know, you're letting in all these terrorists criminals and diseased people. I mean, I think you can make a very compelling argument against illegal immigration and open borders without having to resort to that. Now, incidentally, I, uh, I don't 
think it's demonizing to say, listen, we don't require the same thing that we require of American citizens medically. Well, let me let me put it to you like this. To be a teacher in a public school, you still have to get a TB test. And I, I very specifically asked the nurse. I was laughing. I thought maybe it was some antiquated law was the reason why we still had to get TB tests. And she said, no, in, in certain districts, teachers are still popping up positive for TB, TB tests. And she very specifically said, because of immigrants. She said it right out of her own mouth, straight to my oh, yeah. face, straight to my face. Yeah. Diseases don't self-originate. They come from other countries. But, you know, that could also just happen from just a regular travel carrying it. It it could. But that's what that's what the nurse told me. Immigration loses its thrust when you kind of resort to, like, second shelf arguments. um, So I so I that 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 something like that could kill my relative. So that's (laughs) illegal. I mean, how many of them have. Our, our carriers of, of deadly enough, ways you can deal with that. enough but, that I have to get tested every time I get a new teaching job. That many. Well, I get it. I get it. <laughs> One of that the many. contradictions that Barack Obama had is that he, he would complain when people, for example, would talk about um, you know illegal aliens committing crimes, and the left was always like, "Well, you know that's so you know racist or whatever." You can't say. And yet, his administration would deport. I think deported over a million people who came here illegally and then committed crimes. So it's like, well, wait a minute. A million is a lot of people, you know? So if you're telling me that a million people came here illegally and committed crimes and you had to deport them, then you, at, at that point, you're kind of allowed to say that it's a bit of a problem. Like, when I was a prosecutor, one out of every six of my criminal cases was against illegal aliens. Wow. You demonize the whole group, but you also shouldn't ignore like what you're saying, that does cause certain health concerns, it does cause also certain other concerns. And by the way, what they don't factor in are the secondary crimes, where somebody comes, a large population comes to the country, causes poverty, and therefore other people already in the country resort to crime. So right. The person now who can't get a job because some illegal is working under the table, now he resorts to a life of crime. Or he can't get the welfare benefits he needs because it's going to someone else, he turns to a life of crime. Or a young lady I spoke about who um, couldn't get a job because the restaurants only hire illegals. Therefore, she had to stay with her husband who was abusing her, okay, because she didn't have the money to leave. Nobody thinks about that. Now, the illegal isn't doing the abuse, but the, the illegal immigration problem created a problem for this woman. So people don't ever factor in the secondary collateral cost of this. Hey, hey Jordan, I want to I wanna, uh, talk about a... a, a tell you about a comment in the Facebook chat right now. Katina Person, who's a regular listener to the show, says that she worked in public health. She's out of D.C. She said they had a TB outbreak in D.C. public schools due to illegals, and they were told not to inform the parents. They didn't want the backlash against illegals, and to make sure it was kept quiet, they threatened to pull the funding. She said, telling the truth is not demonizing anyone. It's stating the facts. Yeah. Conservatives are bad at messaging. And True. I don't believe in I don't believe in leading with stuff like that. Okay, I, I agree with that. It, 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 I, I think it's just better to lead with um, broader, you know, broader arguments against costs and, and things like that, and just you know, general necessity. But you're you're undeniably right that you know when somebody comes here undetected, any large group of people is going to come here undetected. In that group, you're going to invariably have some people that have certain challenges that are going to be imposed on the rest of us. I mean, it's just, that's just undeniable. Oh, for sure. And I mean, that was my argument uh, during the RNC convention. Uh, she said, yes, Lord, we're horrible with messaging. Uh, during the RNC convention, that was my whole argument with the whole like arena full of white people, except for like me and Jeff Booker yelling, lock her up, lock her up. I was like, that had to look really terrible and racist on TV. Like, I just didn't think that. I'm just kidding about it just being me and Jeff Booker. But I'm sure there were like maybe three other well, black people I, there. I, I don't get about that. You remember that post I put up like two years ago where I said, every time I see a Republican in New Jersey do a television commercial, I, I know that one of my five black friends is going to be on it. It's going to be like Jeff or you or a boy or whatever her name is. Uh, it, it, it's just like we, we need a larger cast of characters to start casting in, in these things, you know? 
Exactly, because there, there's not that many of us, especially not in New Jersey. We're such a red state. It was such yeah. a blue state, rather. Blue state. Yeah, it's very true. But that we can lead, we can lead with funding, but at some point they have to know the fact. It, it's true. It is very true. I, I just wish that we had we had that the Trump administration before it was a Trump administration had messaged with the economic factors first and then kind of led into the other stuff. I agree with you on that. So that we just, it, it, and didn't focus so much on the crime and the health. Like yeah, it, it, we, we could have spread it around said, some. And I, I wrote an essay about this that was published in the star ledger when he announced his candidacy and he, he came out and said, Mexicans are criminals and racists. I was like, that is not how you address this problem. Yeah, like, the dude. The is a problem, but not, that's not what you do. Right. Like, that's a problem, but there are also, like, many other problems and many other ways that they could have addressed it. Well, listen, we're at the close of the show. Before we go, tell people how they can get in touch with conservativeopinion.com and how they can follow you on Facey and Twitter and all those other all that other stuff. Well, by, as the name implies, they can go to conservativeopinion.com. That's also uh, what we have uh, on Facebook. By the way, someone's trying to pirate my website. They created theconservativeopinion.com. And, oh. uh, I, I've, already, I've already gone to, to get that trademark, so they're going to hear from me soon enough. But anyway, mine is conservativeopinion.com. There's a great article, by the way, on there, Melanie, you might like. It's called The, uh, the Illegal Immigration Speech That Donald Trump Should Have Given. I wrote it a few months ago. Um, it basically quotes about the Democrats and what they said about illegal immigration three or four years ago. But anyway, that's, yeah, conservativeopinion.com. Uh, the Facebook page has, we do a half a million views a month. We got 26,000 uh, very active people. So, you know, we'd love to have as many people on and just having a good time and, and spreading uh, spreading uh, truth, justice in the American way. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for doing my show tonight. I appreciate it so much. All right, I'll send you my bill. <laughs> you know, I can't afford you, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now we will definitely right. make that happen. All right, honey. Have a great weekend. I want to thank right. I want to thank the one and only Jordan Rickards for being on the show this evening, and also Karen Eldad for the first hour. Just a, really a, turned out to be a fantastic show. I was not having an awesome day, and I tell you, my guests really made it happen for me. I'm so glad I did the show. I want to thank Katina Pearson, everybody who commented in the Facey chat. You guys did such a good job. Doug Poss. Uh, Keith Little, I believe, was also in the Facey chat. Everybody who was in there. If you were listening to this via a uh, download on iTunes, I want to thank you if you're listening via SHR Media. Thank you very much for listening. I want to thank my uh, my sponsors, Tax Mama, a.k.a. Eva Rosenberg, Robert Houston, Mr. Credit Repair.biz, and also Biz Social Personal Touch, Don Campbell. Thank you very much for sponsoring Money Talk with Melanie. Remember, all of this is very important because after all, it's your money. Have a fantastic weekend. <laughs>